Okay, in this video we're going to describe how to deal with uh, the situation where you have complex roots of the uh, denominator polynomial. Um, we've already sort of looked at this in the previous uh, videos. Uh, it turns out that complex roots of the denominator polynomial means that you're going to have sines and cosines or exponentially damped sines and cosines. And so we've looked at a couple of those cases in previous videos. What I'd like to do in this video is go through and derive one way that you can actually uh, have MATLAB do a partial fraction expansion of your H of S and then by inspection determine what the sines and cosines ought to look like. Okay, and I'm actually going to derive this. Uh, those of you who don't like long derivations, uh, what you could do is uh, just fast forward this video and I promise before I uh, write down the final result I'll put a big result or something like that on the screen so that you know where to stop fast forwarding it. So in just a minute I'll tell you uh, um, how, or well, go ahead and tell you to fast forward it. Um, so the idea is when we do a partial fraction expansion uh, with uh, MATLAB, we get uh, terms that look like this. I'll just draw two of them because that's as many as I need to work with. But in fact, there may be many more terms depending on what the order of ds is. And again, when we have a complex root of ds, that means that p is going to be complex. And it turns out that as long as the time function that we're going to get is real, which in the real world they all are, uh, it turns out mathematically quite often if you're dealing with communications or signal processing you look at complex time functions. But if the time function is real, then if I have one root that's complex, I'm going to have a second root, and that second root is going to be equal to the complex conjugate of this first root. Okay, And you'll recall that the complex conjugate is just uh, uh, P, the complex conjugate of P1. I, I get that by changing the sign of the imaginary part. And it also turns out that R2 is going to be the complex conjugate of R1. Okay, So that's how you can tell that you've got a pair of, I mean basically what you're looking for here when you're trying to uh, uh, to do this inverse Laplace transform is you're going to look for a pair where R1 is the complex conjugate of R2 or R2 is the complex conjugate of R1 P2 is the complex conjugate of P1 and if you find that then you know that this pair of terms together is going to give you uh, cosines and sines, or a cosine and a sine in the uh, time function. So uh, that's almost all you need to know before you can start fast forwarding. The other thing is I'm going to define the terms in R1 to be a plus jb. And it turns out that this a is going to give us the amplitude of a cosine b is going to give us the amplitude of a sine. I'm going to define p1 to be equal to minus alpha minus j omega. Okay, this is the alpha is going to give us the rate at which the exponential terms decay. Omega is going to give us the frequency, the radial frequency, at which the sines and cosines wiggle. Okay, so that's where I get these, or, or that's where I'm going to get a and b, alpha and omega, that will show up uh, at the end result. Okay, so if you uh, don't want to sit through an exciting uh, derivation, then at this point you can fast forward till you see uh, some 
big result on the screen, and uh, you can then stop. Okay. So what I want to do here, and uh, I don't want to spend more than one video doing it, is actually plugging in R1 and R1 conjugate, which is R2 here and here, P1 and P2, which is P1 conjugate, here and here, and then just working out these, uh, this term algebraically. Okay, so um, I'll just actually start writing out what we get when we make that substitution. And you'll be pretty excited to see this large mess. Okay, so we're going to have A plus JB over S minus P1, which is S plus alpha plus J omega, plus A minus JB, that's the uh, uh, A minus JB is the complex conjugate of this guy, over S plus alpha minus J omega, because I have the complex conjugate of this term as well. Okay, and so what I'll do next is just cross multiply these things. Uh, we'll cross multiply this term and this term to get everything on a common denominator. And when I do that, I get the following expression I get a plus JB times S plus alpha minus J omega, that's this term times this term, plus A minus JB times S plus alpha plus J omega, that's this term times this term, divided by S plus alpha minus J omega times S, well, that should be a plus, plus alpha minus J omega. Okay, so there you have it. And all you have to do is simplify this. Uh, what I'm, just algebra basically. I'm going to do the bottom just to show you how it works, and then I'm going to not do the top because uh, I don't want to go over one video here and I'm not sure that it's all that useful. So I'm going to, in the denominator, I have S times S. That's going to give me an S squared. Okay. I'm going to have S times alpha minus J omega, which gives me S times alpha minus J omega. I'm going to have alpha plus J omega times S. So I'll write that as S times alpha plus J omega. And finally, I'm going to have alpha plus J omega times alpha minus J omega. So we have alpha plus J omega times alpha minus J omega. Okay. So now when I start actually working these guys out, I get results that look like this. Um, this S times alpha plus S times alpha is going to give me 2 S times alpha. And I have uh, S times minus J omega, which gives me minus J omega S, and S plus J omega, which gives me plus J omega S. So this term and this term. So they're going to cancel each other because I'm going to have a minus J omega S plus J omega S. Those terms cancel. So then um, when I work out this one, this is basically uh, a complex number times its conjugate, and so that's going to give me alpha squared plus omega squared. Okay, 
the alpha terms uh, multiply to give me alpha squared. j omega times minus j omega, uh, I get minus j squared omega squared, but j squared is negative 1, so I get plus omega. So these two terms give me the omega squared, and the cross terms basically cancel each other out because the signs are opposite. So here I get s squared plus 2s alpha plus alpha squared plus omega. Again, we're working through the denominator here. Okay, and I can write this part of it as s plus alpha squared plus omega squared. That's where this guy comes in. Okay, so what we have is that the denominator is equal to s plus alpha squared plus omega squared, which shows up a lot in the uh, Fourier transform tables, or I'm sorry, the Laplace transform tables. If you work out the whole thing, um, go through all, so this basically gives us the denominator here. If you work out what the numerator is and simplify things, you get the following result. And I'm just going to write it down because it would be a whole other video to derive it and I don't want to do that. So you end up with 2a s plus alpha over s, whoops, uh, I'm uglifying things, s plus alpha squared plus omega squared plus 2b times omega over s plus alpha squared plus omega squared. And now we have to write result for those that were skipping ahead, those that are not strong enough to do real math. So, okay, those of you that did skip ahead, now you know where you are. Okay, so we'll get rid of it. Well, yeah, we'll get rid of it because we still need the space. Okay, so this term, the first term, transforms to 2 times a e to the minus alpha t cosine omega t u of t. Okay, and the second term transforms to 2b e to the minus alpha t sine of omega t u of t. Okay, so basically the whole idea here is that by looking at the values I got for r1 and p1, I can look at those values, the real part of r1 gives me A, the imaginary part of R1 gives me B, the real part of P1 gives me alpha, and the imaginary part of P1 gives me omega. And we'll stop there.